So just so you know, um, I always record these things if I've got three or more of you um, and we share them. The way I see it, if there's less than three of you, it sort of ends up usually as a more personal conversation about people's actual work and that just doesn't feel fair to share with people who haven't made the time to come. Um, and so we've got a few people here. I can see a small number of you. I would love to encourage those of you who have cameras to turn them on because it makes it just so much more interesting for us all. Um, so hopefully this isn't actually everybody remaining in our class that we haven't had everybody just drop out after a uh, first class of me throwing lots of admin things at you and some pretty turgid reading. Um, I, usually I don't hold a class in the first week, the tute, because we're just sort of setting the standards uh, and we're really talking about the position of, or probably a better word is the jurisprudence of contract law. We're talking in the first week about why we even have contract laws, but I did run out of time. So there were a small number of slides at the end that I thought might be useful for me to go through um, at a very marginal way. But largely what these, these tutes will always, from my point of view, be run by you. So I use these, I want them to be driven by you. I am happy if you let me know in advance what questions you would like me to focus on. Um, but I'm also happy to deal with questions and to have a conversation about pretty much anything. Um, as driven by you um, and usually the best way for me to get a sense of what you're understanding not understanding what you're interested in is from the questions that you ask so I will always come with a bit of a plan even if it's just a quiz or a kahoot or something for us to to do uh, but usually I'm coming with as open mind as I can to work out what your questions are and where I need to go. So in that note, and on the basis that I will take you through the last couple of slides that I didn't show you the first time round, does anybody have any questions, observations or comments that they would like to make? Um, you mentioned before the question of like, is this people's first or second semester in the program and how they're going? So for me, it's my first. Um, so I suppose, so it's like all very brand new. Um, I suppose what would be sort of maybe two things for someone just starting and around and maybe how they approach the readings and sort of get themselves to understand um, the concepts? What a fabulous question. Um, of course, I'm going to give you a really frustrating answer, which is this is really going to be on you. And there is an element of trial and error. Have we got anybody here who is not in their first semester? who was reading cases last. Uh, Harry and Hello. Rita and Cassandra, tell, are you prepared to share what worked for you? Um, yeah, um, organisation. Um, particularly with yeah. Actually, why don't we go ask, ahead, I'm gonna ask Cassandra to go first, because she looked the most nervous about it. <laughs> And I'm still quite nervous about it. Um, yeah, this is my second semester. I'm doing it part-time and also working full-time. Um, and I haven't studied for about eight years and I found it extremely um, difficult getting back into it. Um, so I'm only doing two um, units a semester and I find that that's enough for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, organisation. I think I'm a bit more mature when I was in my undergrad and I'm actually, I'm, I chose to do this so I'm wanting to, to learn. Um, yeah, organisation, just setting time aside to do the readings. The readings is, is if you don't get on top of it, um, I think it's real, it's a struggle trying to get back, you know, where Talk you're at. Talk to us a bit about the actual reading. Like, when, which, so this subject and uh, many others, particularly core subjects that are similar, you have a bundle of cases to read. If you're lucky, you've got a case book which has extracts. So it tells you exactly what you need to read. And then you've got a textbook, which is an academic writing about the reading really in a sense. Which do you, which do you think you should read first, the text or the cases? Definitely the textbook. It just makes it a little more clearer for me. Um, and then going to uh, having a look at the cases sort of brings it all together, sort of it, it, it 
clarifies a lot more what I've read in the textbook. That works. It's definitely my approach too, but that's, that's habit as much as anything else. But um, is there anybody who likes to go, and it's usually about 50-50, usually there'll be people who find it easier to start with the cases. Is there anybody from that school of thought here? Not really. I guess why I think particularly early on the textbook is more useful is it's telling you why you're reading the cases and what the cases stand for. And then you can read the cases and you can see where you're looking for something in particular. Um, in fact, one of the things, and let's talk about it today actually, um, but one of the methodologies that you will have been introduced to is, is referred to as Iraq. So not the country, but <laughs> issues, rules, application, conclusion. I'll, I'll put my hand up here and say, I think Iraq is, or Iraq, what if it's, a, it's a, well, anyway, it's an acronym. It doesn't really matter how I pronounce it, does it? Um, I think it's limited sometimes. Um, and again, that's me coming to it as a transactional lawyer. Uh, as opposed to a disputes resolution lawyer. Um, the one that also partly, the one I learnt at uni was called MIRAF, where, which is basically exactly the same thing, except M stands for material facts, identify the material facts, then identify the issues, then identify the rules, then apply the rules, and the T at the end is for tentative conclusion because I went to Sydney Law School and at Sydney Law School only High Court judges were allowed to make conclusions. The rest of us had to actually make tentative conclusions. So anyway, I'm just, nobody actually spoke like that. I just made that up. Uh, and, and the thing is, I actually found while I was at law school, and I've recommended to many people since, that sometimes actually having that, will you use Iraq, will you use Iraq, but you've got to look for the facts anyway. Just having that acronym sitting next to you when you read the cases and actually looking through, looking in the judgment for, well, what are the material facts here? What issues are the judges really looking at? What laws did they identify as being applicable? What rules? How did they apply those rules? And particularly looking at well, was it a unanimous decision? Uh, was the rule discussed differently by a minority judge? Those kind of tweaky things. And then lead to the conclusion. Because in reading cases, the conclusion that we're reaching is this is a legal principle that somehow is going to take me through and help me understand this part of the concept better. And in a sense, that's what the case book does. Uh, sorry, the textbook does. It gives you that high level. But if when you're going through the cases, you can look for that. The reason why, quite frankly, probably smarter people than me like using going to the cases first is to do that because one, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Not every case is only relevant to one point and not every point only has one corresponding case. And so there are a number of cases that we're going to come back to over and over again, where a really good understanding of the whole of the case will help you see the way the law applies in a much more multifaceted, multidimensional way. So ones that we're looking at this week include Carl Hill and Kabbalah Smokeball, which is a seminal case. Um, everybody who's ever studied contract law pretty much anywhere where there's a common law system will have heard of that case and it is relevant to so many different points that come up. Another one that will come up quite uh, quickly is the Australian Woolen Mills case. Which I always laugh about as being, there's always somebody in every class I teach who just is really frustrated by that case. They just find it completely frustrating that it just doesn't make sense that it ended up the way that it did to them. And the only solution to that is to actually read the whole thing. Um, it's like, I, I now know that that is the only salve, um, but probably lazy uh, people like myself, lazy is the wrong word to say to any of you, efficient is probably the word I want to use. Um, 
reading a textbook first and knowing what you're looking for in the case, I think really helps you. And then what happens over time is that will help you with reading cases because later on when you're solving a problem, you're actually looking for cases that will support your solution. So you don't know in advance what it is that you're looking for in the case. You just, you want to know how the law deals with a particular point or a particular issue. And the practice of doing that will help you go through. So Harry, you put your hand up as being in second semester as well. Mm -hmm. um, how, have you got any tips or tricks that you could share? Um. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, not particularly. Um, I find the ratings really useful. I probably am the kind of person where things like assignments is where I do probably most of my valuable learning because the applicability of certain things and the sort of reaching your own determinations through like navigating certain information and points made in cases is probably where I find myself actually engaging with the content most and learning the most. Because I think a lot of the time you can spend hours like glossing over readings and potentially not take much of it in. But when you actually do need to synthesize an argument or a point, you can draw from that reading you've done and sort of regurgitate it in. Yeah. So, and look, again, I think that's, it's re if, if that's the kind of learner you are, Mm. and the science would suggest most of us are, that we retain more and we make sense of things more when we do something with it. Mm. Um, so what I would recommend for that kind of learner, again, which is most of you, that you do find the time to do the quizzes that I put in the and the particularly each week the little discussion board tasks. Yeah. Uh, and one of the reasons, too, that I like you guys to do the quizzes is... If I ask a question in class, well, there's a couple of things that can happen. Firstly, if I ask a question in class and I ask, you know, I ask Harry a question and he answers it and he gives me a perfect answer first off, that's just terrible for Unlikely. me. Unlikely. <laughs> well, good, I'll remember to ask you. Um, it is, it's actually the worst thing that can happen from my point of view. Um, and that's because firstly, Harry's not the only person in the class. I have no idea whether everybody else understood what the answer to the question, what the question was, much less why that was the right answer. Actually, I don't even know if Harry knows why it's the right answer or not. He might have just hit on a lucky guess or, or flipped four slides in advance or something like that. Um, also, the people around him that are nodding furiously, they might have been weighing up between two or three things. As soon as they hear Harry say something out loud, it's very easy. We call it confirmation bias. Mm. We basically, just then we, we pick that thing and we stick with it. And we say to ourselves, yeah, that's what I would have chosen. If you actually go through the act of doing a quiz, and all quizzes that I've got, well, actually, to be fair, the ones that are in Canvas, I can work out how well you did. I'm not going to. It, like, it, I, I don't have the time or the energy for that. Um, if you are asking me about a quiz question and you want to talk to me about it, I will probably pull it out there and we can have a look at it in that way. Um, but I'm more likely to be looking at it to make sure that I've set it up correctly and I haven't inadvertently given the wrong answer as correct or something. Um, but... At the end of the day, it's completely anonymous. And those ones we do in class, so whether they're cahoots or they're more likely to be those poll everywhere ones because the cahoots sent for primary school children and they're really limited in what I can put in the question. Like, anyway, if you don't, too much information, can't stop. Anyway, um, the act of actually committing to an answer gives you the opportunity to realise whether or not you actually were going to commit to that answer or not it's very easy to tell ourselves that we would have got it right. Uh, and so actively doing the quizzes, actively doing the discussion board tasks, things like that will give you the opportunity to get some feedback and to really use the material. Um, and so I've put a lot of those things in there. As, and I think I mentioned this in class. Some people, that's overwhelming. There will be some people who have always done absolutely everything and it just gets exhausting. 
that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to overwhelm you. I'm giving you many different opportunities to learn in the way that suits you. And for some of you, it'll be doing those things. Some of you will look at them and say, actually, these are quite similar in a whole lot of ways. Like, well, yeah, they are. And if you're just continuing to get everything 100% right, don't bother with them. If you get it straight away. But, you know, chances are if you get things straight away one week, you won't the next. So it'll all even itself out. Does that help? I can't remember who asked that question. Dean, he's got his thumb up. He's under, this is actually, um, by the way, I, you can't really see my room here, but I have this massive television set on my wall. <laughs> see it like glowing at me. Um, it's just, it's ridiculous, but it works for me. Um, but it just means that there is a lot of space with your lovely faces um, and itty bitty print on the side. And I'm a person who looks at people's faces, not at the itty bitty print. So often I won't notice if people put questions in there. So wave your hand. Today it's that way. Just indicate that way and I will know to look at the print if that's what you want to deal with me. Any more questions? Okay. I did say we were going to be quick today. I am going to, oh, there is the link. not actually open. I am going to open this PowerPoint and just, sh oh, what's going on? Oh no, all good. Um, I am going to put it into that mode. Um, Oh, that's very big. Maybe I'm not going to put it into that mode. Oh, I know what I do. I just swap it around. Sorry, that's something I probably should have had sorted out in advance, isn't it? Monitor, primary monitor, hit there, go from the first slide and then share it with you. A couple of things. I just wanted to talk where we ended up was here. She says, hopefully. Okay, and then we go like that, and then we go share, and you go like that. Okay, sorry, that was a lot of mucking around. You should now be able to see that last slide that we were talking about last time, um, which had a way, way too much information on it for a slide, but I thought it might be interesting to those of you who want to see what the development is. And then, no, the button won't press. Yes, it will. So the point that underpins all of this, and in a way, how do I explain this? Um, one of the things that I think, we start with this topic where we start with an introduction, gives me some time to get to know you, but also really start with asking this question, why do we have laws about contract in the first place? And that gives me an opportunity to provide you with this sort of general overview about the formation of contracts, but also give, and gives us a, a, an opportunity to think about what contracts are and what contract lawyers do and why we have a particular set of laws. But it is a little bit asked about because at the moment you don't know what those laws are. Um, but... I can launch straight into the laws and then at the end give you these kind of methodologies and at that stage you'll be saying to me well why didn't you introduce that at the beginning because I need to answer critical analysis questions these are the kinds of questions I should have been asking myself about the law as we went and what will happen through the whole of the semester is you're going to be doing lots of problem solving but in the exam and you get a couple of opportunities in the uh, discussion board task, you're going to be asked for your opinion as well. You're going to be asked what you think about what the law is and how it works. I also think the value in having this kind of information at the beginning is some of the rules that will apply are going to seem at the beginning counterintuitive to you. So in particular, next week, we're going to, uh, next week, tomorrow, we're going to start talking at, hopefully we'll get to it, invitations to treat. 
So have any of you done the readings around invitation to treat? So Boots Cash Chemist is um, probably the key case that we'll look at, but there's also Fisher and Bell and Partridge and Crittenden. And, and they're cases about how effectively who makes the offer. And at risk of spoiler alerting you, um, in most cases, when you see something in a shop that is being offered for sale, that is in fact not an offer. It is an invitation to treat. And it is the purchaser who offers to buy and the vendor or the shop owner or the sales assistant who accepts that offer. Now, that might not seem like a big deal right at the moment. It might not mean anything to you terribly much as you read the cases, but it will feel counterintuitive. We think when I go and buy a house, the person who was selling the house was offering it for sale and I bought it. So I'm the person who accepted. But in fact, it's almost entirely always the other way around. When I go in to buy my lovely new Harry Potter t-shirt, do you like this one? I love it that there are so many fat kids now. Kmart lets me buy, you know, children's t-shirts. They're much more fun than adult t-shirts. And like, yeah, works really well. So keep fattening up your kids, I say. Oh damn, I'm being recorded. I really shouldn't say shit like that. Anyway. Okay, let the complaint start. Um, so, but I go in, I find this T-shirt. I think it's amazing. I want this T-shirt. Um, it has a price tag on it, but the shop is not offering to sell it to me. I actually take it. In this particular case this week, I took it to an entirely electronic device. I basically scanned a barcode you know, on the screen offered by the robot, scanned another card, I effectively made an offer to purchase this. So it's counterintuitive to what we expect as non-lawyers. So we have to start thinking about, well, why is that? Why does the law work that way? And that's what these readings are all about, is identifying why it is that the law is like that. And we had some really valuable conversation in Monday night's class. I'm hoping those of you who are online heard that recording. We had this conversation about the value of commercial transactions happening in a consistent way. And that that has a higher economic value as well. I usually have some economists, I always have accountants, but I usually have some economists in the group as well. Um, and so, yeah, I drive those people insane because my knowledge of economics is pretty limited. Uh, but at the end of the day, one of the things as a commercial person that I can see is that if you know when you do a deal in a particular place, that it's going to be enforced in a particular way that provides a level of certainty, that is better for commercial people. So that brings us to this idea of contract as being a private law. So we have this idea of public law and you'll deal with many public law subjects across the course of your program. Um, criminal law is a public law area. Torts are public laws. Anything that's in a statute is usually, well, almost always a public law. In other words, it's a law that applies to anyone and everyone in a particular jurisdiction. So in relation to tort, for example, everyone has a duty of care to their neighbour. What that looks like, what is reasonable and unreasonable might be a matter of argument. But at the end of the day, if you own a property, you have a duty not to let your cows escape that property and wreck other people's fences. Uh, or your water to flood other people's drain pipes or whatever it happens to be. They are duties that you owe to the public, regardless of who or where they are. Criminal laws absolutely work that way. Um, they, they're framed as negative duties. We have a duty not to kill people. There is a consequence if you kill somebody. 
there is a consequence if you break a criminal law. Contract, on the other hand, there is a consequence if you fail to keep your promise under a contract. But the consequence is just between you and the other party to the contract or the other parties. By the way, I will often do this, reduce things to the most uh, basic uh, and talk about contracts as you and them, singular, the parties, as if there were only two. Um, it is quite possible and often happens that there are many parties to contracts. Um, it's, it's not always a one-on-one -on -one situation. The other thing that's interesting here in relation to private law is this idea that um, the parties to the contract owe each other duties. And this is tied up with company law to an extent. Most commercial contracts, most well, actually, let me put it this way. Most contracts that are negotiated and involve a lawyer on a day-to-day -day basis will actually be contracts between companies. Now, you will, as individuals, have entered into many contracts every day over time, and many times you enter into those contracts as an individual with a company. So your telephone contract, for example, uh, your mobile phone contract, is probably a contract between you as an individual and a telephone Lethany Provider, Optus, Telstra, TPG, whoever it happens to be. So you're entering into contracts with companies. Commercial business to business arrangements are almost always between companies. So companies have the capacity to contract. They can sue and be sued in their own name. Uh, they, can, um, yeah, they can make promises. They have capacity to contract actually when i'll leave the magic of this to company law when you get there but they can actually be bound to promises that were made before they existed so the directors or the founders of companies can make what are called pre-incorporation contracts uh, so they can be held to contracts that before they even existed unlike us as people um, other than in some limited circumstances we can't be held to contracts that we enter into before we reach our majority or so I'm using the technical terms so until we have capacity to contract which generally happens when we're either sober or 18 or ideally both um, so this idea of legal personality is relevant here too just something you need to be aware of by the way stop me if you have questions just wave me down I am looking at you um, one of the things that's important here too is that the theory behind contract law is that one of the reasons why promises in enforceable contracts should be kept, why they, why they are enforced, is that the parties voluntarily accepted that liability, that obligation. Uh, that is actually less and less likely or true as time goes on. How many of you have clicked I accept without actually looking at what the words say? Um, I watched, um, she was a very slow a documentary on Netflix last night the, called The Great Hack about the Cambridge Analytica thing. Um, really took a long time to get to the point on it. Um, but again, it's really interesting this idea of what's happening with data that we share about ourselves um, and we can and don't necessarily envisage the ways that that data can be used um, and it is quite interesting particularly those of you who have small children uh, who uh, might like to play games on iPhones and iPads, you might find it a really useful thing from time to time to actually go and read the terms and conditions for those things. Um, partly because it's just good practice as being a lawyer, looking at what it is that you might find interesting there. But it's actually you as the account holder who is effectively and often giving permission for a corporation that you probably 
have no idea where or who they are, uh, to read your children's messages or to <laughs> share information about who they are. Um, again, um, and I think 10 years ago, it was actually not unreasonable to say, I've got nothing to hide, I don't care. But these days in actually knowing that algorithms can predict with such accuracy about how you're going to like and likely react to things that they not only send you advertising about things you might be interested in buying, but send you news that you might react to before you vote for somebody, it actually gets a little bit scary. Um, again, I digress a little bit, but I think this assumption, this underlying assumption in contract law, that one of the reasons why we should uphold contracts is because people voluntarily entered into them. I actually thought, we, I think we can call bullshit on that much more now than we ever have. Uh, and so then the question becomes, and one of the things that we'll see is that we then end up addressing that by a legislative overlay. So that there will be legislation that provides particular requirements. So in the example I've been given, we turn to our privacy laws, for example, to help us with that. Um, but they, again, spoiler alert, they may be more limited than you expect them to be. Um, so a big part of the reading was looking at the differences between contract and tort, and particularly the section that I've highlighted on the slide here was really comparing them one by one. Now, many of you will have done tort. Some of you are doing tort now. Some of you will be doing tort in the future. But that third category, this is a bit annoying because it's, it's going to be quite difficult for you to get your head around. Let me tell you now, it's of limited practical application in this subject or otherwise for the time being. It just provides you with a baseline for thinking about why we have this set of rules for this kind of commercial transaction, which is different from a set of public rules that apply in a different situation. I think what's really interesting in the case, I think it's particularly well written, actually. I, I enjoyed reading it. And get out lots, as you can tell. I spent Saturday night watching a documentary on Netflix. I outed myself on that. And then I've just said I enjoyed reading this bit. Um, but I thought that the bit in the textbook, the way that it talks about how the, the difference between the fundamental positive and negative approaches of contract and tort was really interesting and quite clearly written. So it, the, the passage talks about how both ways, uh, both, so if, if somebody breaches a contract or they breach their obligations in tort, then the natural remedy is damages. Um, and it talks about this idea of concurrent liability. So if somebody does you wrong, you have the opportunity to look at, should I sue them in tort or should I sue them in contract? And the law says you can use whichever of those in fact, you might bring the actions jointly, but whichever of those gives you the best outcome. Um, but at the end of the day, you can't get damages twice. But what's interesting is in tort, if you suffer some sort of damage as a consequence of tortious action, then the way that damages will be calculated is to put you in the position you would have been if the tort had never happened. In contract, it's actually kind of the reverse. If somebody breaches the contract, the intention of the parties was presumably that when the contract was fulfilled, the parties would be in a better position. Either, you know, I would have received the services that you promised or the money that you had promised me for performing the services. And so in fact, damages take us to that different position, to that uplifted position. Now, we don't talk about damages in this course at all. That's probably the last time you're going to hear about them. A lot of the time when we're talking about the question of whether there's a contract, though, the reason for that is somebody hasn't kept their promise and somebody wants to sue. So we don't go into, will a suit be successful? What would the damages be? We just look mainly in the subject of whether there was a contract at all. And in the last three weeks or so, we look at, and what did the contract mean? 
Um, equity, we do touch on equity. But I'm pretty sure that none of you will be studying equity yet. And if you are, give me a call and let me think you out of it because you really need to have a little bit more behind you before you get there. Um, but it's important. One of the things that you no doubt will have discussed in intro uh, is this idea that we have, we used to have two sets of courts effectively, the Chancery Division, the Equity Division and the Common Law Division. Now, way back in, I want to say 1872, um, but I could have just made that number up. The courts were fused in most places other than New South Wales. Um, and I mean, most not only throughout Australia, but in the UK and other words. So you could effectively, whether you were common, whether it was a common law or an equitable action, you could bring both in the same court. In New South Wales, it was into the 70s. And I, and again, I think we're, that's why I'm thinking 1872 is quite wrong because I've got 1972 in my head as the year that they were um, they were fused. Um, I actually spent the first 10 years of my practicing life in New South Wales. And um, I also, I went to Sydney Uni. So I, one of the significant differences I've noticed between, well, people of my age, practitioners of my age from Sydney and everywhere else is we tend to think about equity as a more uh, amorphous, no, amorphous is the wrong word, a, a more uh, significant chunk of the law separate from the common law. And we tend to think a little bit more carefully perhaps about whether you use a deed or otherwise and what the differences are. And I think that's just because of that, that separation in New South Wales was that bit later. And it's probably no longer the case now because I'm just showing my age. This grey hair is completely natural. Um, so where was I going with that? Um, so thinking about equity, the equity stuff is going to frustrate you from time to time. In particular, you'll spend more time talking about a stopple in advanced contract law than we do in, um, in this subject, but the question of a stopple will come up from time to time. I need to turn my fire off. I'm like, I'm absolutely boiling in here now. Um, so estoppel is, it's a very old word based on the original Latin, um, kind of is exactly what it sounds like. Um, if you get an order of estoppel, that means that a person is stopped from making a claim. So an estoppel will prevent a person who otherwise may be able to claim a breach of contract from claiming that breach because of something, for, for example, reliance. So probably actually the better way to put it is and often estoppels will stop people from claiming that in fact there was no consideration or that there is some reason why a contract wasn't properly formed and they'll be prevented from making that claim because somebody else has acted in reliance on them because an equity would be the, co or an inequity would be the consequence of allowing them to make that claim. And, and equity here just means unfairness, really. Um, what else do I want to say about that? Um, the textbook's quite good on this point as well. Um, Equity itself is it developed to ensure that these injustices that happened as a consequence of the strict application of common law rules could be avoided. These days, we're more likely to see that those injustices are addressed or purportedly addressed by statute. Uh, that we have a more, it's, it's more likely that things like, so, sorry, let me give you an example. Um, if somebody makes a misrepresentation, so if I represent to you that this beautiful bunch of flowers are actually made of solid gold um, and worth a million dollars each, and you believe me because I'm entirely trustworthy 
uh, and you spend, you give me a million dollars for each of those gold plated flowers and it turns out that they are just roses from my mother's garden and I've misrepresented them to you, there would, and there would be an inequity or an unfairness if that contract was enforced, if I was allowed to claim that million dollars per flower. Uh, and so in, common, in a common law environment, we would be looking for um, some basis in equity to stop me from making that claim against you in contract. But in fact, what happens is instead we have the Australian consumer law, which says thou shalt not in trade or commerce mislead or deceive people. Doesn't matter whether you intended to or not. The only question is whether somebody is misled or deceived or if a reasonable person might have been. And as a consequence, a cause of action then arises under the statute. So that's probably the best one that I can come up with off the top of my head as an example. And which leads me right into the next slide, which is ultimately that so much of this will overlap. Now, again, you'll find this a bit frustrating because I will be asking you to solve problems and quite often saying, yeah, but I don't want to know about the statutes. Because what we need to do in this subject is for you to understand the fundamentals of how the common law applies and then we'll build on top of that how the statutes change that. Um, contract law has a number of international influences, um, particularly um, in the last 10 years or so in international trade and commerce. Um, again, because as the world gets smaller, as international trade and commerce gets um, more frequent, uh, having a consistency in the way that people can deal with each other is more useful. Um, again, you should be aware of it. Uh, there are conventions that deal with international contracts. Um, we're not going to spend any real time with them, but you can be aware of them, please. It is worth noting, though, that not all contract law is the same as Australian contract law. Many of you will be tempted to solve a problem by typing in something into Google. And there's lots of stuff on Google about a lot of the cases that we deal with. Um, double check that it's not American. Part of, and don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of Google. I think it's a great place to start. It's just a stupid place to finish. Uh, so make sure in particular, because most of, most of what you see on Google comes from the States, and the reality is that the American system is different from the Australian system. They, they also have a contract code, which we don't have. Um, and we do have our own cultural and social distinctiveness, particularly since the mid-70s. Um, basically, since, yeah, well, since 1986, the High Court has made itself clear that it doesn't appear bound. Um, cases like uh, Walton Stores, which we'll come across as we go, and others have really pushed us away from some English decisions in more recent time, including in relation to com uh, common law. But probably the last 10 or 15 years, that seems to have narrowed back a little bit more. Uh, I can do that now. Oh, yes, I am. So... This is kind of the mantra that I mentioned the other day. You'll be saying this in your sleep before too long. In order to have a contract, we need to have these four things. Agreement. Agreement is generally made up of two things, offer and acceptance. An offer that is made uh, in such a way that it bundles together all of the terms of the contract so it can be understood um, and that that offer is then accepted without any variation and the acceptance is communicated. So we need that agreement. We need consideration. For the time being, I'm just going to talk to cons about consideration as meaning price, but consideration does move both, both ways. In order for an agreement to be enforceable under Australian law, there needs to be an exchange. So an exchange, usually an exchange of promises, a promise to do or give somebody something in exchange for a promise to pay an amount of money. But often there are, it, it's more complex than that. 
there needs to be an intention to be bound. Intention itself gets wrapped up in this idea of offer. An offer that doesn't indicate a willingness or an intention to be bound may not in fact be an offer. Um, we also have this idea of certainty. So in fact, the offer needs to make it certain what it is that is being offered. Um, and certain has, certainty has a number of different elements. It means certain as in uh, clear what the terms are. Uh, it means certain as in complete all of the relevant or essential terms are embroiled in it. So we will deal with each of these as one, you know, as four separate topics. And we start on agreement or offer and acceptance tomorrow. Um, we'll start with offer uh, is most of where we'll be. Um, and effectively, I'd like to, you to think about this as a, as a kind of jigsaw puzzle, um, where in order to get the full picture of what a contract is, we need to have all of the pieces. We're going to examine those pieces one by one, but they're not linear. They're interrelated. They lock together in the way that a jigsaw puzzle locks together. Um, and so we're going to really kind of, we, we're going to just look at the trees before we step back and see the whole of the woods. So again, so we're going to, the next two weeks will be on agreement. Weeks four and five will be on consideration. So we're going to spend a lot of time in this territory. And one of the reasons that we do that is because you'll necessarily be learning about the other topics as we do that as well. Also in the weeks, uh, in week three as well, I'm going to need to talk to you about how to write a legal memo because you're going to need that for an assignment. So there's a bit of a carb away out of the topics as well. Uh, in week six, we'll look at intention and in week seven, we'll look at certainty. Um, once we've actually got a contract form, then there's this, these vitiating factors that can impact us. Now, I've already spoken a little bit about capacity today. So the parties to a contract need to have capacity to contract. And if they don't have capacity, that doesn't mean that you don't have a contract, but it might affect the ability or uh, to enforce that contract against the party who suffers the incapacity. We need to talk about informalities and we're going to need to talk about privity. And again, uh, formalities we're going to cover off in week seven with certainty. Uh, week eight will be capacity and as will privity. So we'll bundle those up pretty quickly, but we'll see them as separate topics. But again, part of the whole jigsaw puzzle, they are interrelated. And then we'll go on to discuss how, how to read a contract effectively. Um, no, actually, you, you will not walk away from this subject being able to read contracts. Well, you will, but yeah, you won't be able to hold yourself out overly as being able to read contracts. It'll be the beginning. You will start to amass the skills to think about how to do that. Um, Couple of concepts that I want to make sure that we're carrying with us as we think about this. This idea of the difference between validity and enforcement. So an invalid contract means there's no agreement at all. The Latin term is void ab initio. Ab initio means from the beginning. Um, we're gonna come across a number of these technical expressions. A number of them are in Latin. Um, some of you will be much better at Latin than I am. Um, I'm a great believer that the reason we use Latin is because the concepts are really straightforward and we wouldn't be able to charge the big bucks if we just said it in plain English. My favorite Latin expression is re ipsa locuta. It means the words speak for themselves. They spoke for themselves, just say them. Uh, so this is my roundabout way of saying I am not impressed by people throwing in Latin for the sake of throwing in Latin. Um, if you need to use the Latin term and you need to use terminology appropriately, you need to make sure that your client understands it. So think about your audience. So if we've got an invalid contract, we've got nothing to enforce. But if we have an unenforceable contract, the contract itself might in fact be valid, probably will be valid but one or more of the parties is 
suffering some incapacity or some other vitiating factor. And the circumstances could be different for different parties in different circumstances. So an agreement with a child, for example, um, a minor, might be enforceable against one child but not against another because their circumstances might be different. And we'll get to that when we talk about capacity. Don't worry about it now. But the child almost always can enforce the contract against uh, the other person because the other person doesn't suffer the incapacity. So it's only unenforceable as against the person suffering the incapacity. I don't want to do that now. Do a lot of this classification. You'll find that we're constantly going back and I'm giving you lists. That should we look at these as which cases deal with enforceable contracts, unenforceable contracts? Which deal, where are we talking about unilateral contracts or bilateral contracts? Why do we do that? We classify contracts in different ways because they help us understand them and work out which rules to apply. Because what we're doing is we're looking at what the issues are, we're apply, identifying what the rules are, we're applying the rules to reach a conclusion. So again, these kind of classification tools can be helpful to you. Uh, so we can classify them by reference to the form that they take. So is it just a simple contract? A simple contract might be verbal. It might be just, I offer to do this for you. You accept my offer. I then am bound to do that thing for you and you are bound to pay me the price for doing it. Or is it a formal contract? Is it something that is documented? If it is documented, where are the documents? Are they all in one place? Who has ob ongoing obligations? We'll spend a bit of time tomorrow talking about unilateral and bilateral contracts. Have any of you weighed through that in the reading so far, trying to get your head around the differences between the two? Um, it does tend to be a little bit of, I'm going to say a rude word, I won't. Uh, it does tend to do your head in a little bit, uh, but um, it's also very rare that it's an issue and it's really only an issue if the contract's unilateral. By far, most of the contracts that you are dealing with will be bilateral contracts. Bilateral in the sense that at the time that the contract is made, that the obligations of the parties are executory. In other words, at the time the contract is made, both parties have obligations to each other, even if that's only for a second or two. In a unilateral contract, at the time that the contract is made, only one party has an obligation. Because the contract is made, the offer is accepted by the party, by the offeree doing the thing that the offeror has asked them to do. But we'll talk about that in some detail tomorrow. You can also classify contracts by reference to their effect. So void, voidable, uh, unenforceable, valid, this kind of language you need to get your head around. And then this idea of status. So executory and ex executed are words that often I see used incorrectly in assignments. So I like to point those out. Um, an executed contract could usually means in normal parlance, it means a signed contract. But it could mean a completed or a finished contract. That everybody's obligations have been executed, have been done. Executory means the obligations are yet to be fulfilled. So again, some of the marking in a subject like this goes to whether or not you use language in the appropriate way. I said I was going to be quick today and I've only got four minutes to finish. Oh, yes, it says see you in two weeks. I don't know why it says that. I think there was a public holiday last time and I clearly didn't fix it. So let me stop that. So they were the last lot of little points that I wanted to make. I feel like I've been doing a lot of talking though. Do you have any questions, frustrations, compliments? One person should have started me that I only swore twice, maybe more. There are at least two occasions I was going to and I stopped myself. Um,
What was that? Sorry. But I heard somebody. Apple Apple end user use a license agreement on South Park. Human centipede is well worth a watch as it makes the point that all of the clauses favor Apple. I haven't seen that. I am going to find it. Um, there's an Australian blogger called, I want to say Amy Tan, but I will find it. Um, I know I've used it when I've taught uh, consumer law, um, who <laughs> basically uh, does a spoof about um, uh, what happens when she uh, had all these um, end user license agreements she signed without looking at. And a few years ago, one company or a I think it was a university actually as an experiment actually included a clause in their in some of their contracts that said that if you contacted them uh having to demonstrate that you had read this clause um, by this particular email they'd send you a thousand us dollars and they didn't do it and they didn't have anybody contact them or a very small number um, and I think in a similar experiment, there was a clause in the middle of an agreement that basically said you sell your soul to the devil um, or you give your first, you have to hand over your firstborn and the Amy Tan spoof has the devil showing up at the door asking for her, her soul to be handed over. It's quite amusing. But yeah, look, at the end of the day, um, it is a myth that we, um, that we have equality of bargaining power. Jenny Patterson, who wrote your textbook, uh, used to be a partner at Mallison's. And um, I heard her say once uh, that in the entire time that she worked at, uh, well, it's now King and Woods Mallison's, uh, and she worked for banks in financing arrangements, the only time that the borrower showed up with the loan agreement, the borrower was Rio Tinto. I mean, the bank always writes the loan agreement, right? The party who writes the agreement, they their lawyers are looking after them. That's what we do. So that's what makes responding to uh, contracts so much fun because you're looking at them and you're trying to work out, well, what, what does your client really need? What are the rules to the game that they really want to play? I'll be looking for that South Park thing. If I can find it, I will share it. Any other questions, concerns, frustrations? Stephen, I feel like you want to say something because you've gone yellow, but your phone is muted or your microphone's muted. No, um, well, I've just had some technical issues, but I, I have a concern that I've dialed in really late um is, was did you set it for say 6 30 till 7 30 or 7 30 till 8 30 6 30 till 6 30 till 7 30 all right so the key learning for me in this one is attention to detail <laughs> that's all right. all right there is a there will be a video in the next 24 hours or so i, I get to do it again thank you <laughs> uh yeah so um, I'm sorry that it is actually worth mentioning. I, I understand there was, I, I, the time is clearly not suitable to everybody. Um, I was really hoping I'd get up enough for a, um, a lunchtime on Thursday, Wednesdays or Thursdays, but it wasn't going to happen. Um, the 7.30 time was equally popular to the 6.30 time. Um, I just picked 6.30 then because I thought it means I can drink wine sooner. Um, hmm. <laughs> uh, but then I'm going skiing next weekend, so I might be then uh, asking your indulgence to make it 7.30 instead. Maybe we alternate weeks um, or I'll just be doing it before we leave Mount Buller. I don't know. Kath, um, hello. Hi. Um, full disclosure, I've just, yeah, it's cool. Um, I've just arrived from interstate for a period of time um, and have just been doing a bit of catch-up work um, over the last couple of days. Are there any key... I've, I've done my best catching up with the week line readings, but are there any key jurisprudential theories that you think are fundamental to understanding um, the like the, the, type, the, the content to the course? Are there any thinkers that you think... 
I think um, the chapter be really chapter worth chapter getting two, across. I think the chapter two of the textbook is probably the key uh -huh. peak here at this stage. Come back to the others. Um, but that idea of a private law is probably yeah. what you want to have. At this stage of the class tomorrow, and that means a recording ready for, uh, I, sorry, uh, some of you are looking a little bit familiar, um, but I'm assuming some of you are OUA as well. Um, if you're, yeah, um, for getting into next week, um, basically the first half of the chapter, if you're focusing on offer, and then I did list out in my kind of checklist email um, uh, the cases that we'll focus on. So in particular, next week, uh, tomorrow, we'll be looking at uh, Gibson and Manchester City Council. We'll look at Carl Hill and Cumberlick Smoke Ball. We will probably talk um, a bit about um, uh, Boots Cash Chemist, Partridge and Critigen, uh, Fisher and Bell. We might get on to Welcome and Mobile Oil, but I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, if you're looking at the office stuff, that's probably the best place to be. Yeah, um, awesome, thank you. I was just wondering mostly about um, sort of those theoretical standpoints yeah. from last week, but this week is not yeah, an issue, not, but thank you for that anyway. First week is a bit of a weird week mm. and it will be, It's I will continue to come back to it. It'll be the week I keep saying. Now, remember, right at the beginning, we started to think about um, private law. The yeah, other thing is, and again, this is counterintuitive to most law students in particular, because you guys are smart and you're used to being the smartest. Uh, one of the things that you kind of have to get used to is letting it wash over you a bit. Mm. Um, reading it and just accepting I don't necessarily understand all of this right now and getting getting some habits together for what you're going to do about that. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of the coloured post-it note. Um, actually, there's, it's pretty clean over there for a change. You'll see on many of my videos, the back wall there is just covered with post-it notes. Um, often I find if I'm just reading something, I find a nice soothing colour like blue. Blue means I've got no friggin' idea what this is about. I'll just make a little post-it note and I'll put it there and then later on I'll come back to it and see if that's made sense to me. A little colour coding can go a long way. Um, as Because the thing is, until you know where you're going, uh, it's hard to know what what landmarks to observe. Think about Think about trying to explain how to get somewhere to someone else. And if you've been there plenty of times, you can talk about the landmarks along the way. You know what's worth looking out for. If you've never been there, you can't talk about landmarks. You can only talk about north, south, east and west. So you've kind of got to go. You've got to go there first. But, you know, I've been doing this for a while. Pretty much everybody's got through so far and only a few of them have complained. So, you know, I don't think many are scarred, but well, they probably wouldn't tell me, would they? So you'll be fine.